up here. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Evening, technically, 6 o'clock. Good to see everybody. We don't see you yet, but you know what I mean. Uh, glad to have you joining us for this Bible study in the middle of our week. Uh, thanks for uh, being understanding as to last week. I'm still fighting vertigo and headaches, but I'm feeling definitely better today than I was last week. So we're going to get started with our talk. Uh, it was interesting what I was going to talk about tonight actually overlapped with another study that I was doing. And in a way, I really didn't think it would. And you'll, you'll understand, I hope, as we get to that point. But um, earlier this week, I was talking to somebody about uh, Jesus preparing our home in heaven. And I've always liked that imagery, and we're going to go there in John chapter 14 here in a moment. But then I was also, earlier than that in the week, I had been studying the topic of hypocrisy and thinking, hey, well, this is interesting. You know, I haven't taught on hypocrisy in a while, maybe because most of us don't want to hear about it. Uh, but the relationship that we have with Christ and what hypocrisy means to us, how many of us would happily admit that we're hypocrites? Uh, I hope more of us would regrettably admit that we're probably hypocrites at some point in time, some attitude of ours, some some behavior of ours uh, goes against the very nature of what we promote as Christianity. And that creates its own kind of problem when we're trying to make an example for Jesus. So we're going to talk about Jesus preparing a place for us, but we're also going to talk about the caution of hypocrisy in the path that we walk. So we're going to start off, as I said, in John chapter 14. And bear with me, I got, I'm got i sitting in the chair, but I got my little hard to read Bible and my bifocals. Some of you heard me talking about my transition lenses are not working quite as good as they need to, so they got me a new prescription coming. I know, I know, Sean's getting older. Uh, but John 14 verses 1 through 4 it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And I want you to hold on to that because that's what we're going to come back to. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Uh, now, Thomas is a little puzzled by this comment, and so that's why the passage continues on with Thomas asking this question. Verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus' response is this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I've been thinking about this a little bit. We always... We like to think, you know, one of my favorite songs, Mansion on the Hilltop. Uh, I'm satisfied with Jessica. I love that song. It's very energetic. It's very positive. It gets you smiling and thinking about heaven. But I want to focus on a different thing that Jesus says there. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, how many of us are doing any preparing to go home? I mean, really preparing. God's getting us ready. But but take it from, from a man that has moved more than anybody he's ever known in his life. My dad was a preacher. We moved a whole lot when I was a kid. My, I'm a preacher. My kids have moved a whole lot with me through my life. And the thing is, it's once you've made a home, it's not very easy to just all of a sudden decide, okay, I'm leaving today and I'm moving. It takes time. It takes preparation. It takes packing. It, it takes throwing away a bunch of stuff. It, it requires you to, to really uh, alter your entire life to accommodate the fact that we're getting ready to move. So Jesus makes this comment to us. I'm going to prepare your place. But how many of us are preparing our life to be in heaven? Now, don't misunderstand what I'm asking, because I want you to, th this is going to, I hope, a little bit thought-provoking tonight. I'm not asking you how many of us are eager and excited about going to heaven. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking how many of us are actually preparing ourselves to go to heaven. 
It's a much bigger deal. Thomas asked this question because Jesus is saying, I'm going to go prepare a place and you know where I'm going. And he goes, we got no idea where you're going. And we don't know. You're saying we know the way. What way? What are you talking about? And I wonder how many Christians, that's still their question. Wait a minute. What is the expectation of me from Jesus if he's going to prepare a place for me? What do I need to do? See, too many people out there think that, well, Jesus is doing all the work. Jesus is not doing all the work. He did a lot of work. He's laid a great foundation for us to, to depend on. But there is still huge expectation on our part by Jesus if we really want to inherit that heavenly home. How many of us are doing the legwork necessary to prepare? When we move, we have to go get boxes. We have to go get buckets. We have to pack everything up. Then you got to clean everything and you got to throw stuff and you can take multiple tri trips to the dump. And there's so much involved with me preparing myself to move to a new place. But today everybody thinks that they don't have to do anything. That there is no prep work. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Well, that is the clue to this question. Jesus is saying, I'm showing you the way to get home. Sorry about the grunting. My dog is going crazy over there. Jesus is showing us, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the, I'm the example that you need to follow if you want to have a heavenly home that I'm going to prepare. So here there is expectation. There is this understanding that Jesus is doing his preparing, but he expects us to be preparing as well. Well, this brings us to the second passage we're going to get to over in Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. Now, Matthew 24 is, is a great uh, chapter that we've been talking about a couple times, actually, in different classes. Uh, this is the uh, chapter that Jesus... Uh, I just mentioned the other day, references for uh, the apostles saying, when are these things going to pass? It's an apocalypse chapter. It's not so much the apocalypse, the bad stuff, but this is what's going to happen before Jesus comes back, the end of time, and all of that. But I want to take us to the end of the passage. Let me get where I need to be here. Uh, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant who his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Y'all see that? So doing. Not so sitting, not so sleeping, not so laying back and relaxing. But when the master comes back, he says, boy, he's working. She's busy. They're preparing. They're doing what I've asked them to do. So that's what it says here. Uh, but, verse 48. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 47. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming. And begins to, be to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of the servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, it's the word hypocrite got me on this because, I, like I said, I was doing a study on uh, the hypocrites and Jesus has, uh, uh, it, hypocrite's kind of his word. There, it shows up a couple other times in the New Testament, but most of the time, almost all of the time, any reference to somebody being called a hypocrite is a Jesus word. It's a it's an accusation of somebody that is not living the way that they are speaking. So here, when we're looking at the, the good and faithful servant passage, a good and faithful servant is someone that is acting in the same manner that they are speaking. A lot of people in the world out there talking about the love of Jesus and not many of them actually showing it. 
not many living up to it. How many times do we talk about how important it is to behave in this way or that way as Christians, and yet behind closed doors, we're not like that at all. See, hypocrisy. When we get evaluated as a good and faithful servant, the reality is God is going, are they hypocrites? Or are they really good, faithful servants? When Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and my Father's house are many rooms, if it weren't so, I would tell you, but I'm going to prepare this place for you that where I am, you will get to be there also. Who do you think he wants to live with? People that talk a good game, but actually are the exact opposite of who he's called them to be, or the ones that are actually walking the walk and talking the talk. Today we have this, this struggle are we looking forward to a home in heaven? Usually the answer is, yes, I am. But if that is actually our true answer, our true answer, not our hypocritical answer, but our true answer, what are we doing to prepare ourselves for a home in heaven? Are we walking the way we're supposed to walk? Are we talking the way we're supposed to talk? Are we preparing our lives to show that we are worthy of the calling for which we've been called? Have we actually started to anticipate? You all, you know me. I love the thought of looking up one day in those clouds. And I'm not saying I'm good at it either. I'm saying I'm a work in progress. My desire to go to heaven is great. I want it so bad. But some days, the will to do the way I'm, live the way I'm supposed to is a struggle for all of us. It's easy to be lazy. It's easy to complain. It's easy to be arrogant, pompous. But how many Christians are the reason people don't want anything to do with God today? Whose fault is it that, that the world has turned its back on God? Is it God's fault? Or is it ours? Because we have misrepresented him for so long. We have made his name look bad for so long. We have used Christianity as a crutch for selfishness, for, for, for uh, hate, for all of these terrible qualities, instead of using it to show the true glory and nature of God. Because when Jesus says, I'm, I am the way, he's not just saying, I'm the direction you walk, meaning go north. But he's saying, I'm the direction you walk in your life. Walk like I walk. Talk like I talk. Behave like I behaved. Jesus was about 33 years old, and he had already counted his life on this earth forfeit. He knew he came to die for us. He had prepared his own path to the cross. His apostles argued with him. Peter debated it with him, basically talked down to him, and Jesus is going, hey, I know who I am. I know I paraphrased a whole lot of verses there, but that's what he says. I know who I am. I know why I'm here. I know what job I've come to do. You've heard me talk about his prayer in John 17, and in it he says, the glory that I've received, and he's talking future tense, but he's talking as though it's already happened. I'm about to die on the cross, and the glory I get for that, God be glorified. See, he's already counted it. How many of us have already said, my life is forfeit on earth because I am living it for heaven? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and I'm going to be the way, the truth, and the life that he set for me. That's the life that I'm going to show. I don't want to be a spiritual hypocrite. I know you don't either. At least, I, I hope we don't. I don't want God looking down at me, and you've heard me reference this one lately, but, you know, I don't want him to say, um, I don't know you. My Matthew seven twenty one verse. Who are you? You're not mine. I know you, you call yourself a Christian, but you are not mine. I don't want to hear those words from Jesus on Judgment Day. I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the relationship we want to have with God. That's the relationship we want to, to take from the life that Jesus lived for us. So I want to encourage you tonight. I want you to think about the preparation that you're making 
to go home to heaven. Realize it's not just about looking forward to heaven. We have to prepare to go home. Jesus has prepared our room. He's getting, got it ready. Now it's just a matter of whether we're going to prepare to go there. Uh, I hope this encourages you. I hope it gives you a little thought-provoking provo- uh, stimuli to get you going through the week saying, hey, how can I do this differently to live as the man or woman that, that God called me to be? Uh, looking here, I see we got some people online, but uh, I don't know of any brand new prayer requests. There are a few out there, and they, they should be online. But there's a lot of prayer requests needed. Uh, I hope that you will keep praying daily. Make sure that God knows that you are his. We develop our relationships through communication. This is true also with God. It keeps us close. It keeps us intimate. So make sure you're praying. And with that, let's pray. Dear God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day that you've given to us. We thank you so much for your son who was the way that, that showed us what it meant to be a Christian and how we should walk and how we should talk what kind of life we should leave. And Father, we just pray that you will help us to prepare our lives as as willing sacrifices for your, your path. Father, we just pray that you will guide us, lead us, and help us to open our heart to, to your will. Watch over the many in our congregation that are on our prayer list, those that are even beyond our, our congregation, but on that list that need your guidance, need your comfort, need your peace. Father, we pray that you will help us to to live to be the men and women you've called us to be. We love you so much. We thank you for your son. Pray all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Love you guys. Hope you're having a great week. Uh, Keep praying. But uh, just hope we get to see most of you Sunday morning at church. I know some of you don't live in Oregon, but we are so glad that you are joining us here. God bless. Talk to you soon. Sean loves you.